Yes, this is the moment you've waited for. Welcome. We are so glad that you're here with us today. For those of you joining us online, stoked to have you tuning in with us today. Hey, it is Baptism Sunday. And uh, we sometimes just throw these baptismals out without announcing it ahead of time. We've had people baptized at all of our services, people uh, getting phones out of their pockets, keys out of their pockets, coming forward and getting baptized as a follower of Jesus Christ. The Bible says that baptism always follows belief, and it's where we publicly identify with the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So if you're here today and you've never been baptized as a follower of Jesus Christ, you can do that Mother's Day 2018 right here. It's going to be absolutely awesome. I want to invite you to do two things. Number one, grab your bulletins and take out the sermon notes. Great way to track with the message today. And then also, if you've got your Bibles, meet me in Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5 is where we're going to be today. And if you don't have a Bible, we have you covered. Feel free to raise your hand, and one of the ushers will get you a Bible in just a moment. We are in a 14-week series uh, on the greatest sermon, uh, looking at Matthew 5, 6, and 7. It's the greatest sermon because these are the words of God himself. God in the flesh, Jesus Christ, shared this Sermon on the Mount, and we are in week two of The Secret of Happiness, looking at these Beatitudes, and we're going chapter by chapter, verse by verse, through this entire passage, uh, you know, Jesus and his teaching, it's, it's opposite of what we think. It's backwards. It's radical. And uh, it's been amazing to see what God's already doing in our lives through this series. And he uses this word, uh, blessed. In the Greek, it's um, mar- markos. It's, it's happy. It's this happiness that's not based upon the world. It's this happiness that's only possible with Jesus Christ. Because moms, everybody wants mom to be happy. Because if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. That's just the reality, right? Because moms get asked so many questions. Uh, Mom, can you help me get my clothes? Can you get me food? Can you take me to school? Can you help me with my homework? Mom, can I have some money? Mom, can mom, 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 dads? We get asked one question. Where's mom? Right? That's just the reality. Where's mom? And so it is, it is difficult to be a mom. I pray that today you are encouraged. I pray that God gives you a whole lot of a joy and just affirms you in your role as a mom. A, a mother of teenagers was having a rough day, and she stopped, and she paused, and she said, now I know why animals eat their young. <laughs> just keeping it real. If you didn't laugh at that, something's wrong with you. All right? I'm not judging you. We're talking about that in a couple weeks, but I'm just saying. Uh, but, but there's something about um, our attitudes. And last week we looked at the reality that that attitude really is everything. Life is so much about how we respond to life and not what happens. And so we will either tend to be a Debbie the Downer, a negative Nancy, or we will be a, a joyful John. You know the joyful John, the guy that you say, how was your day? And you're like, you know what? He's, he's like, you know what? My house burned down today. But my eternal home is in heaven, so I'm doing well. You know, you know anybody like that? They're just happy all the time. Raise your hand if you know somebody like that. They're just joy, joyful, John. And then there's negative Nancy, right? Who's a negative Nancy? It's 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 a mom that looks at her son and says, "Son, if you fall out of that tree and break both of your legs, don't come running after me." You're just like, okay, if he breaks both of his legs, I don't think he's going to be running after you, mom, you know? Um, but, but attitude is everything. And we're looking at the secret of happiness and these attitudes that lead to authentic happiness, real happiness. And last week we looked at the first four, and this is what they were. Attitudes that lead to authentic happiness. Happy are the humble. Happy are the broken. Happy are the meek. Happy are the hungry. These attitudes that really have to do with our walk with Jesus Christ. And we're looking at the next four that have to do with our relationship with others and how we respond to others and how we love others because we've sought to have these attitudes where we're right with Jesus. So we're going to stand right now and honor the reading of God's word. Matthew chapter 5. Starting in verse 7, these are the words of Jesus. Jesus said, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. 
And blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Heavenly Father, God, right now we just invite, we ask, we beg that you would take over. That you would take over our lives, that you would take over our hearts, that you would take over our thinking, our motivation. We would just be more like Jesus. And so God, those areas of our life um, that need to change, those areas of our lives that are off, we just ask that you would have your way in our lives today. God, I humbly ask that you would take over my mouth, my mind, and my heart, that you would communicate the message you have in store for your people today. It's in your precious name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Attitudes that lead to authentic happiness. We're going to jump right into number five today. Happy are those who show mercy. Happy are those who show mercy. Jesus said, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Now, mercy is something that we can extend to other people when and only when we've experienced that mercy from God. When we experience this mercy from God, it changes the way we think, it changes the way we act, it changes the way we talk, it changes our heart, our mind, everything about us changes because we've experienced the mercy of Jesus Christ. And I want to even take it a step further, for us to not show mercy to other people would clearly demonstrate that we truly haven't experienced and received the mercy of Jesus himself. Now a lot of people get confused and mixed up the difference between grace and mercy. And I want to simplify it. this. Grace is simply this. Grace is God giving us something we do not deserve. It's God giving us something we do not deserve. Well, if that's grace, what is mercy? Mercy is God not giving us something we do deserve. It's not giving us something we do deserve. So in, in our lives, mercy demonstrated by God is that we deserve Judgment. We deserve hell. We deserve eternal separation from God. And God in his mercy does not give us that because of Jesus Christ when we have Jesus in our lives. But he also gives us grace, which is forgiveness, which is a new chance, a new life, eternity with God. It's grace and mercy. In fact, author Max Lucado put it this way. He said the difference between mercy and grace, mercy gave the prodigal son a second chance, grace gave him a feast. It's this experience that we have with God that allows us to extend it to others. And, and mercy demonstrates itself in, in two simple, clear, powerful ways. First of all, mercy demonstrates forgiveness. If you want a practical, tangible way to demonstrate mercy, it's through forgiveness. And Kay Warren last year came out and shared her story. Uh, she's the wife of Rick Warren, one of the most uh, popular um, pastors of influence in the entire world, lead pastor at Saddleback Church in Southern California. And she, she shares in her story in Christianity Today last year in 2017 that it was mercy that saved their marriage. Mer mercy saved their marriage. And she started just sharing her story. She was an open book. She said, hey, at the age of four or five, I was molested. Didn't know how to deal with it. Didn't know how to communicate it with my parents. I hid it. Uh, for several years. It was when she was a teenager, she went to babysit. She found a, a magazine and she looked at pornography for the first time. She was, she felt horrible. She felt just shameful. And she said, I'll never do that again. And she didn't until she went to the house where she babysat again. And there she looked at it again and again and again 
and again and she, until she developed this addiction to pornography. It was 19 years old where she got engaged to Rick Warren and they finally got married at 21, both of them under the uh, advice of many people that said, hey, don't get married. And uh, it was during their honeymoon that they realized that they were having major issues in the five areas where they were warned about. Major issues in sex, communication, money, talking about children in the future, and in-laws. All five of those areas were just super difficult. And there was bitterness that developed. There was resentment that developed. In year two of their marriage, Kay Warren described it as a living hell. And then uh, they got to a point in their lives where they started going to counseling. Individual counseling, uh, counseling together, and they started dealing with a lot of these issues. Because Kay opens up and says, I thought if you were a follower of Jesus Christ and you're just a Christian, that, that marriage wouldn't be this difficult. And she gets to a point in her life where she said this, quote, I know what it's like to choose to build your own relationship, to seek marriage counseling again and again, to allow our small group and your family into the struggle, to determine one more time to say, let's start over. And please forgive me, I was wrong, and I forgive you. We'll read those one more time. I believe those are some of the most powerful words we can say in a relationship or to, to other people. Let's start over. Please forgive me. I was wrong, and I forgive you. She goes on and says, we beat the odds. Beat the odds. She had cancer, melanoma cancer. Their son struggled with depression, eventually took his life in the midst of all of this, she is in love with Rick. What saved their marriage? Mercy. Mercy is what saved their marriage. And some of you may be here just in this moment thinking, you know what? Um, you, don't, you don't understand my story. I, I don't. But God does. And I do know this. God is not going to ask you to forgive somebody else in a deeper way than what he's forgiven you. I love the way that Warren Wearsby put it. He's a Bible commentator. He put it this way. The most miserable prison in the world is the prison we make for ourselves when we refuse to show mercy. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall be shown mercy. Mercy demonstrates itself in forgiveness. Second of all, in your notes, mercy demonstrates compassion. Mercy demonstrates compassion. Uh, it does things for people. I love some of these Mother's Day cards that I saw recently. Here's some of them. Here's a mom that goes into uh, the doctor's office, and she is just exhausted, not feeling well. Um, I'm irritable, exhausted, stressed out. And the doctor says, I won't sugarcoat it. You have kids. <laughs> I'm just, just keeping it real. Here's the next one. I'm the second child in my family. Who else is the second child in your family? Yes, you will love this card. If at first, mom, you don't succeed, try, try again. Happy Mother's Day. Love your second born. Holler, right? Come on, second born children. I love that. And maybe one of my personal favorites. Mom, you sure had to put up with a lot of obnoxious behavior over the years, but enough about dad. Happy Mother's Day, right? <laughs> That's more true than we want to admit. <laughs> Mercy demonstrates compassion. And if there's a story in the Bible where we see mercy demonstrated in this way through compassion, it's the story that Jesus told of the Good Samaritan. Now, there's a, there's a man in the Bible that, that's wounded. He's half dead. He's been beat up. Um, people have robbed him. And there's two religious people that walk by on the other side of the road, a priest and a Levite. And then a Samaritan comes onto the scene. And there was racial tension. There was hatred. The Samaritan looks past that. He goes to the man. He takes care of him. He takes care of his wounds. He puts him on his horse. He takes him to an inn or a hotel, pays for the fees for a couple days. He, he actually does these things. And what do we see in this story that, that, that mercy does? What does compassion look like? Three things. They're not on the screens. You can write them down. Number one, mercy sees. It sees with our eyes. See, these two religious men, they saw, but they didn't see. It sees with the eyes of Jesus. It sees people in need. It sees somebody that needs help. It's, it's willing to look past our differences. It's willing to look past the past. 
It's, it sees somebody for who they really are. Mercy sees, second of all in your notes, mercy feels. It says in the story of the Good Samaritan that the Good Samaritan had pity on him. There was something about this situation where he, where he hurt inside for the hurt of somebody else. Mercy sees, mercy feels, and thirdly, mercy acts. Mercy always does something because that's compassion, seeing feeling and acting goes above and beyond. It sees somebody and it goes beyond just good intentions. It feels it. It does something. It responds. And and again, for us to be people that are showing mercy to other people in that story of the Good Samaritan, the person on the side of the road is us. I'm that guy. I'm that guy that's incapable of doing anything about my own sin. I'm in need of Jesus Christ to save me, to heal me, to give me new life. I'm incapable of getting up and living life on my own in a way that will please God. And it's only when we see ourselves as that person on the side of the road desperately needing the love of Jesus, desperately needing the forgiveness of Jesus, desperately needing the life of Jesus. It's only when we see that and we receive it that we can be somebody that's happy Because we're showing that same mercy to other people. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Number seven in your notes is simply this. Happy are those who are pure in heart. Happy are those who are pure in heart. Jesus put it this way. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Now this this is really a, I believe the beatitude that's at the core of the beatitudes. If we we don't have a pure heart, we're not going to be somebody that has this this broken spirit. There's not going to be a brokenness. There's not going to be this meekness. There's not going to be hunger and thirsting for righteousness. There's not going to be mercy in our lives. There's not going to be a peacemaker. They're not going to be willing to experience persecution. Why? Because our heart has so much junk in it. And I love it because he doesn't say, blessed are those who live pure lives. It's, 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 it's our hearts. Happy are you when your heart's right with God. You know, there's something really cool about having a clean heart. A clean heart is somebody that's not living a life that's worried about getting caught. Not worried about getting caught. Pure, what does pure mean? It's katharos. It means clean, blameless, unstained from guilt, uh, the Greek word for heart literally means the physical heart, but it's also the, the thinking, the motivation, everything that goes on in our lives. And I'm not saying that we're going to be perfect, but we're striving to be pure. It's this contamination that's in us. It's the sin in, that's in us that we want to be rid of our lives. And here's why Jesus says, blessed are the pure in heart, because the scribes and the Pharisees, they focused on living a life that looked good to others, where they looked religious, where they kept the law, but their their hearts were far from God. And we're going to see so many times in this Sermon on the Mount where Jesus is going to be speaking specifically about the hearts. It's not just about what we perceive to be on the outside, but it's about what's going on inside our hearts. And Jesus gets on these Pharisees. He gets on these scribes. In Matthew chapter 23, he says, woe to you. He says, you look beautiful on the outside, but inwardly, your lives are like whitewashed tombs. You're dead spiritually. And so Jesus would go on and he would teach in such a way where it's not what happens on the outside that contaminates you. It's what's in your heart that contaminates you. It's not on the outside which makes you dirty. It's on the inside that makes you dirty. And Jesus clarified that in the way that he lived his life. Jesus clarified that it's not about the outside because he would touch lepers. He would eat with sinners. He would do all these things ceremonially that was unclean because he wanted to reinforce that the outside is not what makes you clean. It's the purity of the heart. And the reason why this is such a struggle is that not only was it a struggle for religious people back in the day, but we are consumed with how we are perceived. We live in a culture that is consumed with how we look, how we feel. Groupon 
did a study in 2017 about how much money people spend on themselves and how they look. And they asked over 2,000 people. And uh, it came back and said, ladies spend over $313 a month just based upon how they look, which comes out to over $300,000, I believe, in an entire lifetime. Guys spend 244 on average, it's a little less than $200,000. We are consumed with how we look. Some of you are thinking, man, how much hairspray did you put in your hair today, Pastor Jeremy? I'm talking about judging others in a couple weeks. Come back, all right? How do, we, how do we deal with this in our own hearts? Two things in your notes. The pure in heart are without mixture. Without mixture. Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. In other words, there's, there's not room for for us in our hearts, it's this single-mindedness. Um, for my life, I realize that there's contamination in my heart. Uh, there's a lack of, of just purity when, when it's more about my motivation and the motivation of Jesus. If it's more about what I want than what's best for Jesus, my family, and others, I find that my motivation needs to be pure for me to be right with God. A unmixed heart. I think about pure gold. What is pure gold? In the Greek, it means pure gold, all right? <laughs> it's, it's, it's not contaminated. It's not mixed. Second of all, in your notes, the pure in heart receive and live out the word of God. Here's, here's the beauty of this, is that we can be somebody one day that just struggles and look at our own heart and we can see that there's just filth, there's sin, there's idolatry, but through Jesus Christ and the power of his word, he, he purifies our hearts. He cleans us out. We can't do it ourselves. That's why the word of God is so important. John the Baptist said that Jesus would come and he would baptize with fire. Malachi said the Messiah is going to come with a refining fire. What does fire do? It gets rid of the stuff that contaminates us. If you're out camping and you've got water from a river, and you want it to be clean, what do you do? You boil it. What does the Word of God do? The Word of God does something that's so amazing. It just purifies our hearts. As we receive and live out the Word of God, and that's the beauty of the Holy Spirit. David, King David, after his sin in the Old Testament, cries out to God and says, God, would you create in me a pure heart? Moms, that's the, the beauty of Jesus. I don't know what your heart looks like today. Dads, children. But Jesus, when we ask him to purify our hearts, he answers that prayer. And often he does it through the word of God. Happy are those who show mercy. Happy are those who are pure in heart. Number seven in your notes. Happy are those who make peace. Happy are those who make peace. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Uh, what, what do we know about peacemakers? First of all, peacemakers experience peace with God. Peacemakers experience peace with God. Uh, the, the greatest peace that you could experience, this is, this is my prayer for you today, is peace with God. That despite what's going on with your family, despite the struggle with your parents, your mom, your kids, friends, finances, health, all that kind of stuff, at the end of the day, when you stand before God, you have the peace of knowing that you've got Jesus Christ in your life. And to hear the words of Jesus say, well done, my good and faithful servant. That is the greatest peace that any of us could have because Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Jesus came and said, I come that you may have peace. Romans chapter five, verse one, simplifies it this way. Paul said, therefore, since we have been justified, I love that word justified, just as if we never sinned, by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Peacemakers experience peace with God. Not only that, peacemakers experience peace with others. How, how do they do that? Well, we, we can't give somebody something else we don't have. But the greatest thing that we can, we can 
have is, is peace with God that allows us to have peace with others. And it's amazing the way that the Golden Gate Bridge was built. If you look at the Golden Gate Bridge while it was being built, it's got these two big pillars right here in the middle, and it's got these big, huge um, just cables that go across. People that want to experience peace with others take the initiative to build a bridge with somebody else. Where you go up to somebody and say, hey, you know what, the past is the past, or hey, I'm sorry, or hey, I was wrong, and this is what this looks like. I've got this cable, and I'm going to build a bridge with somebody else. Who's somebody that can catch here? All right. Really excited. I love it. Uh, anybody closer? Do you want to? Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Right here? Okay. I'm going to just throw this to you, and you're just going to catch this. All right. Now, what I want you to do is I want you to hold on to the string and let some more uh, loose, and then throw the ball back. All right? So hold on to the string, and then throw the rest of the ball back. So, yeah, there you go. Whoa. All right. So we go ahead and hold on to that. Hold it kind of tight. We are building a bridge. Now what I need is a volunteer to come up and walk across this bridge. All right. No, but, but this is what happens. Notice I threw it to Tyler and he threw it back. But peacemakers take the initiative and then I'll throw it back again and we could have this sermon be like three hours long, but I won't do that. But that's what peacemakers do. Not only do we experience peace with God and we experience peace with others in your notes, this is what peacemakers do. Thirdly, peacemakers help others experience peace with God. We help others experience peace with God. C.S. Lewis put it this way. He said, God cannot give us happiness and a peace apart from himself because it is not there. There is no such thing. There is no such thing as happiness and peace apart from God. Because to know God is to know peace. Where there is no God, there is no peace. I want to say that one more time. To know God is to know peace. But where there is no God in somebody's life, there is no peace. So moms, one of the greatest ways that you can be a peacemaker is to lead your kids to Christ. Is to tell your kids about the Prince of Peace. That your kids, when they go out of the house, that they would walk away knowing the greatest peace they could ever have in their life is a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I still remember I was six years old when my dad came into my room one night and we started talking about Jesus and he said, Jeremy, do you want to surrender your life to Jesus Christ? And he shared the gospel with me. Gospel simply means good news about Jesus. And that night in my bed, I, I followed after my dad. Uh, a prayer, it's not the words of a prayer. There's not a special prayer. We don't see any of that in the Bible, but it's this realness of, of us just crying out to God. And that night I did that. Why? Because my dad's a peacemaker. And then he walked across the room to my brother 10 feet away and, and led my brother to Christ. Because that's what peacemakers do. Not only do peacemakers help other people experience peace with God, they help others experience peace with others. Mom, some of the time, maybe most of the time, all you do is stop your kids from killing each other, right? Just keeping it real. When I was a teenager, there were times where my brothers and I, we would ro ro roll around and we would wrestle, which would soon turn into fighting. And my mom was just tearing us off each other and, and uh, trying to make sure we didn't kill each other. Peacemakers. Happy are those who make peace. And then lastly in your notes, number eight, happy are those who experience persecution. What is persecution? Persecution is any kind of ill treatment, hostility because of our faith and belief in Jesus Christ, because of the way we live our life. And this happens in so many different extremes, so many parts of the world right now. We have brothers and sisters in Christ that are literally getting tormented and killed for their faith. But, but some of us here today, we have family members that just mock us every time we see them at Thanksgiving and Christmas. We have people at school that knock your Bible on the ground. We've got people at work that make fun of us, give us weird looks, make us feel like a fool. Happens on so many different levels. So back in 1970, a, a study was done in the United States, and 40% of people believed that the Bible was the literal word of God. 
Now, more recently, there was a study that was done, and it's, it's, it's dropped down as several, a couple years ago uh, to 28% of people believe now that the Bible is the, the Word of God. Only 12% of people between the ages of 12 <clears throat> and 29 believe that the Bible is the literal Word of God. 88% do not believe that the Bible is the literal Word of God. What does that mean? It means in the coming years, persecution is going to increase like we've never experienced it before. You see churches getting persecuted, people that own bakeries getting persecuted, people trying to be, uh, live a righteous life get persecuted. And there's a couple different reasons why Jesus clearly lays out in this sermon why we will get persecuted. First of all, he says, authentic followers are persecuted because of righteousness, because of righteousness, which is probably why Paul said to Timothy, everybody who wants to live a godly life, a righteous life, will be persecuted. And I think a lot of times we think, yeah, but that doesn't happen so often in America. It was just a couple years ago, we had somebody here at our church that gave their life to Christ, just right here, had to move out from their family. Why? Because of the intense persecution their family would have given them. Folks, this is, this is real. This is happening right here in Modesto. Maybe we don't see it because we don't often deal with it, but there is intense persecution happening all around us. First of all, because of righteousness. Second of all, we're gonna be per persecuted because of Jesus. Authentic followers are persecuted because of Jesus. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you. Sounds like moms dealing with kids, doesn't it? Falsely on my account. But why should, why should we be happy that we're persecuted because of Jesus? Three realities. In your notes, number one, persecution makes you more like Jesus. Persecution is going to make you more like Jesus. I think a lot of us say, yeah, I just I want to be like Jesus when it comes to the fun stuff. I don't want to deal with the loneliness. I don't want to deal with the isolation. I don't want to deal with the physical abuse. I just want the fun stuff. I want to be the guy at the party. When they run out of wine, I grab the water and I turn it into wine, right? I want to be that kind of relationship with Jesus. I don't want to be like Jesus the other way. I want to spit in the mud and put it in somebody's eyes and heal the blind. I want to be that kind of Jesus. Yet to, to really be like Jesus, it means we suffer the way Jesus suffered. Second of all, in your notes... Persecution deepens your faith in Jesus. Deepens your faith in Jesus. If we don't exercise this faith muscle, it's not going to grow. If you just sit on the couch all the time, uh, your muscles aren't going to grow. One of the greatest ways that we grow as followers of Jesus Christ is resistance. The way that the church in Acts, the book of Acts in the New Testament, why did it grow? What caused it to grow? Persecution. Anytime there were people that tried to stop the church, what happened? It exploded with growth. Why? Because persecution will always strengthen our faith. If we want to get stronger physically, there has to be resistance. If we want to get stronger spiritually, there has to be resistance. And then thirdly, in your notes... Persecution gives you eternal rewards. Jesus said, rejoice, be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. We're going to get eternal rewards. We're going to be able to stand before Jesus in the midst of our persecution, in the midst of people mocking us, making fun of us, hurting us, insulting us. To hear the words of Jesus, well done, my good and faithful servant. Blessed, 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 happy, happy, happy. What's real happiness? It's not a happiness that comes from the world. It's a happiness that only comes from a, a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know where you are this Mother's Day weekend, but I do know that the reality for every single one of us, myself included, is that when we came into this world, we all were born with the disease of sin. Sin that separates us from a holy God. And there's nothing that we could do, nothing that we could say, no righteous acts in and of ourselves that we could ever produce that would save us and make us right before a holy God. 
And that's why God sent his son Jesus to do what we can't do ourselves. To go and live a perfect life. To die on the cross in our place for our sin that we can have access in a relationship to a holy God. That's my greatest prayer for every single one of us. Is that you would know and be in a relationship with Jesus Christ. Here's the last question I want to leave you with today. What needs to change for you to experience authentic happiness? Is it your attitude? Is it where you turn to experience happiness? Is it your definition of happiness? Or is the reality that today, for you to really experience happiness, you need to begin with a relationship with Jesus Christ? Let's bow and let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, thank you so much for, for loving us. And God, thank you that, that through Jesus we can experience real, lasting happiness. God, thank you for being a God that has the power to change our hearts, to change our attitudes, to change our perspective. And God, where that needs to be done in our own lives today, will you help us? God, for, for a lot of us here today, our focus is on our circumstances instead of our focus being on Jesus. And if that's the case, would you just shift our focus? If you're here today and you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, Right now in this moment, I want to give you the opportunity to receive Jesus with all heads bowed, nobody looking around. But if you're here today and, boy, you don't really know where you would spend eternity. You don't really know if you're right with God. I want you to be able to get right with God right now in this moment. It can be through a simple prayer that goes something like this. It's not the words of the prayer. It's the cry of the heart. Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I turn away from my sin and I turn to you and I receive your forgiveness. I receive your grace. I receive your mercy. I receive this new life that only you can give me. God, I ask that you would take control of every single area of my life and I ask that the rest of my life would be the best of my life. With all heads bowed, nobody looking around, but if it, if that's your prayer today, I just want to be able to pray for you. Would you just raise your hand and look at me wherever you're at? You say, you know what? I want Jesus. Good. I see that hand. Is there someone else? Good. I see that hand. Who else? You've never done this before, but you want to begin again today. Good. I see that hand. Is there anyone else? Good. Over here. Anyone else? It's the greatest decision you could ever make to give your life to Jesus Christ. Is there anyone else today where you say the cry of my heart is to become a follower of Jesus Christ? Good. Is there anyone else here today? Good, I see that hand. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for the hands that were raised and the lives that were changed. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.